Yeah, well, I, I think this is the question of, of how much we want our conscious states and, and emotional life to actually track the reality of our circumstance in the world. And I think we certainly want it to, to, tra to track reality rather closely. Now, the question is whether we want it to perfectly track. That seems to be, I think, open to debate. But clearly, if, you're, if everyone's taking the happiness drug, this is, in, in some basic sense, materially unsustainable. I mean, if you're, if you're just knocked out on the couch in bliss, you know, and your children are starving, or you have no career anymore. I mean, so there, there are obvious consequences to, well, to you being... Well, you slanted that again. To, to, I mean, it, it wouldn't have to be well, like that. Well, no, no, no. But yeah. so, 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 so the question is, it has to track to some degree. You mm -hmm. have, and so then you kind of dial it back from, from the oblivion of, of uh, the, per, the, the perfect drug. And you ask yourself, well, just how happy do you want to be able to be. So let's say we have a, let's say we, we develop a pill that is the perfect antidote to grief. Say, so somebody dies and you f are inconsolable. You, let's say your child dies. How, when do you want to take that pill? I mean, do you want to take that pill? What, what, do, what would it mean to take the pill the moment your child dies? Okay, so you know that your, your, your daughter has drowned in the bathtub. You are, come upon the scene, your life is ruined, but then you realize you've got some of these pills in the drawer. So you pop the pill and you don't care. Now, that, that in some sense is, is, is conceivable that that's possible. I mean, that actually could be coming, that kind of development. The question is, uh, what, what are you forsaking? I mean, the, what does it mean to love someone uh, and to be completely inured to the, their death in the very moment of their death. I mean, there's, 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 so much of what we value in our lives is an actual sensitivity to reality. Now, would you never want to take that pill? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's possible that you know, somebody could just not be grieving so terribly after the death of someone close to them that you would want to take a little bit of the pill. I mean, you would want to take an antidepressant, as we, as we do now. Um, that seems to me to be perfectly sane, but there's, there's, this, there's this gray area where the question has to, gets interesting and perhaps we'll never feel that we have the, a, a clear-cut right answer, but it's clearly not the pill that leaves you just immune to any changes in the world that, that are actually relevant to your relationships with those you care about and your understanding of what's going on in the universe. You're facing the classic problems that um, moral philosophers have faced for a long time, and you're well, well aware of them, and you've discussed some of them today, some of them in the book. There's the trolley problem, the problem of how you value human happiness against that of other species, which is in your book, but which you, don't, which you haven't referred to tonight. That's another difficult problem. Problems of um, uh, sacrificing some people for the happiness of others. All, all these are difficult problems which have faced moral philosophers for a very long time. But you appear to be bringing to those problems a new thought, which is that science, as opposed to just philosophic thinking, reasoning, uh, could help. Now, moral philosophy is the application of scientific logical reasoning to moral problems. But you are actually, again, you didn't mention it so much in your talk, but in the book, bringing your neurobiological expertise to bear, um, which is a sort of a new way of doing it. Can you t tell me a bit about that? Because um, I'm, I'm not quite clear how doing neurophysiology kind of adds to our uh, insight right. into these moral right. problems. Well. I actually think that the frontier between science and philosophy actually doesn't exist. I think, I think when we, we don't have, when, it, when a question is not e operationalized, when we don't have an experiment we can perform, when we don't uh, know how to get data, then we tend to be talking the talk of philosophy. But the moment, the philosophy is kind of the womb of, of the sciences, and in fact it was physics at one point was called natural philosophy. Uh, the moment something becomes experimentally tractable, then we, it, it, these sciences bud off from, from philosophy. And I think every science has philosophy built into it. So the board, the, 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 there, there is no partition in my mind. Uh, but 
the relevance of neuroscience is born of the fact that everything we experience, everything we care about, every, every instance of, of something mattering to us is at bottom a state of our brain. It's, it, so it, it, you can go one better than just asking somebody what makes you happy. Um, you can actually measure their brain waves or, or, or something. And well, yeah, and, and, this, this goes to the, the, the question of you know, whether we will ever have mind-reading machines. And I, I think we, we do have mind-reading machines. They're, they're incredibly primitive now. But with fMRI, you can make judgments about what someone is thinking, uh, potentially in real time. Uh, and and for, for instance, a graduate student in, in the lab I came from at, at where I did my work at at UCLA, uh, analyzed my uh, data on belief. I did a, 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 a study of, of belief and disbelief, and we just put people in the scanner and had them read statements that were either clearly true or clearly false or, or clearly uh, uh, uncertain. And we just, we just, compare, we just looked for the, the, the difference in the brain between, between truth and falsity, and, and, and we compared them to, both, to uncertainty as well. And so I, I published a couple of papers on belief ba based on that. But then someone else came back with a different analysis that was a called a machine learning analysis where they actually looked to see if they could just, based, based on the raw data, determine whether a person believed something or not in any given trial. So on, you know, on question number 75, did this person believe it to be true or false? And they could detect that with 95% accuracy. Uh, and there have been many other experiments that, that can tell where it's been demonstrated where we can see whether you are thinking of a person or a place, et cetera. Now, that could become arbitrarily precise in the future, and it is certainly a, a possible prospect that you could be have your brain scanned and you could uh, find out stuff about yourself that is not obvious upon introspection, but is nevertheless true of your subjectivity and is, is formative of your subjectivity. So, and, and there are, actually, you don't even need brain scanning technology to discover this. Uh, we know that uh, if, if you are shown that, that a pattern of kind of racist judgment can be detected in virtually everyone, and certainly virtually everyone who thinks they don't have a racist bone in their body. I and mean, if you show people, white people, pictures of, of white and black faces, they're going to much more readily associate negative terms to black faces than white faces. And this is something that, that it, they're, they're uh, uh, psychophysical paradigms that make it just impossible to correct for this, and you are just embarrassingly slower to associate positive terms to another race. And everyone comes out of these experiments mortified, but it's, it's it just, in fact, true of you. Now, you could, you could take that further and have your brain scanned and uh, find out, you know, how much do you love your wife? You know, you could be shown pictures of your wife and think about your wife, and then you could, be, you could think about your last wife, and, uh, <laughs> I, and, and some rather mortifying comparisons could be done there uh, that you wouldn't uh, want to talk about, perhaps. So this is insofar as, uh, and again, there could be some limit we would run up against with the technology. It could just be so, as a, as a physical fact, that, that we will only be able to discriminate uh, our, we'll only be able to correlate our subjective states with our neurophysiology only so closely. But I think mind reading uh, machines uh, uh, are a real possibility in, in the future. Some people would find this prospect very frightening, very alarming. Yeah. I, think. Um, I mean, I think one of the most spectacular examples is the evidence that decisions are taken in our nervous system before we consciously know it. So yeah. when, when yeah. we decide to, to do something, little do we know that several seconds earlier we've already decided, um, yeah. which is another yeah. example of, of where science can actually get inside our minds better than we can, so to speak. Yeah, and th that actually torpedoes the whole notion of, of free will. Uh, I, I think you actually don't need a notion of free will in order to have a, a, a notion of moral truth, and this is something that is, is very counterintuitive to people. But we know free will is a non-starter philosophically and scientifically. Now, many people struggle not to admit this, but however our mental life is caused, it is caused either by 
prior causes or by some randomness intruding, but the, whether it's purely deterministic or there's determinant causes combined with some randomness, neither offer a, a, a space for free will to operate. I mean, just imagine if all of your experience were caused by someone at a computer just, just determining what you feel and do and say and want. Um, that's clearly not a circumstance of, of free will. Now imagine if that person just was determining in all of that, but 10% but, but of the time threw some dice or introduced some other mode of randomness into the process. That doesn't open up a space for free will. And we know, just as a matter of scientific fact, that everything you're consciously intending to do and wanting to do and, think, and judging to be good or bad is preceded by neural events of which you're not conscious. Uh, and of which you are not the author. You are, we, we, we walk through life feeling that we're the conscious author of our thoughts, but you don't think of, you can't think a thought before you think it. So, so, so here's a, an experiment in free will. To think of, think of a famous person. So, do you have a famous person in mind? Well, why didn't you think of another famous person? I mean, you can't, you can't account for if you thought of Ricky Gervais. You can't account for why you didn't think of Eddie Izzard. And that, that goes for every other move you might make that, that's starkly voluntary. You are, things simply spring into consciousness. Now, the reason why this is not morally important is what we condemn in other people is, is not the fact that they really are the, the, the ground cause of their actions. What we condemn are our intentions to do harm, and intentions are still part of the causal uh, framework. I mean, I, I, I only reach for this water because I, I intend to reach for it. I want, I want to drink it. Uh, it's not like I can just sit back and wait and see what happens. And the only way to get to the water is to intend to, to drink it. Uh, and so what we condemn in, in an evil murderer is not the fact that he truly and really and metaphysically is the source of his action. I mean, all these evil murderers have either bad genes or bad parents or bad lives or bad ideas or some combination thereof, and they're not the author of any of those things. Uh, but we still need to lock them up. If, when, you go, when you go to death row and you interview the sociopath and you ask him, what, is, what are you going to do when you get out? And he says, I'm just going to keep raping and killing people. That makes, should make it pretty clear that you want to keep him in there. Uh, but we would keep earthquakes and hurricanes in prison if we could, uh, and we would never think they're evil earthquakes or evil uh, hurricanes. And that's uh, and so there's some things would change about our, our notion of, of, of retribution, say. But the idea that we would have to lock up uh, killers is is uh, not one of them. I think some people will feel quite queasy about that. It 